<laughs> okay. Yeah, that's the talk you were all looking forward to, the last one. <laughs> I don't know you, but I'm quite tired. So, um, what I will do will be a, a, a talk without too many technical details, too many formulae, mostly words and some pictures. And I'll try to emphasize more the, the physics than the math, I would say, unlike in most of this conference. <laughs> okay, so this is the outline. As you see, it covers several decades. Uh, it's, it's in three parts, very, you know, old stuff, which is still continuing. So the arrows mean that the, this is still going on. Something slightly mo more recent, string brain collisions. And then the things I'm really uh, actively doing at the moment, which have to do with gravitational bremsstrahlung from ultra-relativistic collisions, but this third topic has nothing to do with strings, unfortunately. So, um, fortunately, um, Massimo uh, already spoke quite a bit about string collisions and uh, even in the point particle limit. So I will be very brief on this part um, and uh, hopefully get therefore to the, to the end of the talk. So this is a picture of what we are trying to compute. This is a string-string scattering uh, at two-loop level where you see the initial and final closed strings. The green strings are some exchanged strings in the T-channel, which are typically graviton or regiaized gravitons. The yellow strings are strings which are produced in the S channel. For instance, this is, a, this is a big string which picks up all the energy of the incoming particles. These can be excited strings that, as we will see, you typically produce in some regions of parameter space. Now, uh, this process is characterized by several length scales. The impact parameter the Schwarzschild radius associated with the center of mass energy, the string length, the Planck length. The Planck length would always be taken to be very, very small by going to the weak coupling limit of string theory. On the other hand, we can play with the string coupling and with energy and make the ratio of these two scales, the string length and the Schwarzschild radius, arbitrary. So this gives rise to several regimes which are roughly uh, divided into three, but there are sub-regimes as well. Uh, the three main uh, distinct regimes are large impact parameter, much larger than the other two scales, uh, which we can call the weak gravity regime. This is a regime in which strings are big in comparison with the other scales of the problem, and this is what we can call the string gravity regime because that's where you actually see big effects due to the finite size of strings. And then there is a more tricky regime, the strong gravity regime in which classically you would expect to form black holes. And, uh, okay, there, these are topics which I will mention or go over in the, in the rest of the talk. Now, in general, if you go to very high energy, you can, <coughs> you can expect the, uh, the scattering amplitude to have a semi-classical uh, limit. So the S matrix which will be typically of the exponential form with some large phase which is characterized by some classical action divided by h bar. And then you can try to look for an expansion of this classical action uh, in various parameters characterized by these ratios of scales. 
For instance, this is what we call classical corrections because they contain classical parameters, R and B. Uh, there are string corrections with the string length, and we will neglect all the time things which actually depend explicitly on the, on the Planck scale. Now, one little word of warning. The leading term is real here, namely it's a pure phase, and whenever the corrections have imaginary parts, they can take over or become very important even if they are smaller than one, if they mul since the prefactor is large, okay? So this is why the, the three regions are really not enough and you get sub-regions. Okay, so very quickly on the weak gravity, uh, uh, the weak gravity regime, I will just mention the result. First of all, you restore elastic unitarity via a resummation, uh, as uh, Massimo has mentioned, trees violate partial wave unitarity, but unitarity, elastic unitarity, is recovered via this iconal resummation. Then what you find is uh, the gravitational deflection and time delay, which agree with what you expect in an, in an Acherbos-Sexel shockwave metric, uh, I should emphasize that calculations are done in flat space time, so this uh, metric are effective or, if you want, emerging from the calculation itself. You see the effects of the metric rather than seeing the metric itself. There is what we call T-channel fractionation. This is an important point that I take issue with with the fact that, I mean, people usually say that uh, the fixed angle scattering at very high energy is, is treated by the gross mende limit. This is not true, <laughs> okay? If you go to sufficiently high energy, the process is soft and is not given by, by gross mende. I had a big fight one day with Gross about this, they call normal. And uh, the point is that the sum of a loops uh, does not commute, if you want, with the, with the fixed angle behavior of each term in the series. Uh, in short, what happens is that when you do the iconal resummation, you have so many, the loop order is so high that each exchange graviton is actually soft, so that you describe a fixed angle uh, high energy scattering by soft physics, okay? By large, um, large B physics. Um, now, the other phenomenon that you um, see is that um, the colliding string gets excited is a tidal excitation of the strings, and in that regime you can show that the S matrix becomes, is still unitary, but now you have inelastic unitarity, namely you have many channels, but the scattering amplitude is exactly unitary. Now, they, uh, I said in the title that I will mention results and challenges, so this challenge number one is that this treatment of tidal excitation has been carried out only to leading order in the deflection angle, which is of order R over B, as in Einstein. Uh, so the challenge number one is to do this, uh, uh, this inelastic um, process beyond leading order in R over B. And then, still in this regime, there is gravitational Bremsstrahlung but this will be done in part three of the seminar. So if we move down to what we call string gravity, then there are some very interesting effects. First of all, there is, uh, uh, well, here is the list, and then I will go over two of them for lack of time. 
so there is string softening of quantum gravity, a small impact parameter, and this solves a causality problem via the regge behavior of string amplitudes. There is also an interesting point, and that's where gross mende gross mende Oguri comes into play. There is a maximal classical deflection because strings being extended object, they reach a maximal deflection when they graze each other in the collision. So there is a, a, a maximal classical deflection angle. It, if, if only if you look at the uh, cross section beyond that uh, uh, maximal classical angle, you find an exponential suppression which is then well described by Gross-Mende. But as long as the process can proceed classically, the relevant result is given by the icon. Uh, then in that regime, you can also argue for what is now called the generalized uncertainty principle by which strings cannot uh, test uh, length scales smaller than the, the, the string length. And finally, this I will comment more uh, about later, uh, there is the analog of this T-channel fractionation, namely the sharing of the big momentum transfer among many, many small momentum transfer. There is an analog in the S-channel that the total energy gets shared among many, many final particles. So, uh, starting with screening gravity, what happens is that, uh, for the moment, let's neglect these corrections and concentrate on strings, string corrections. This classical, um, um, the, the string correction screen quantum gravity, which would be, tend to become very large a small impact parameter, um, and they lead to, a, to a, an iconal which doesn't diverge um, at small b. It is finite and can even be trusted for b much smaller than, the, than r. Uh, and this, as we'll see in part two, solves a potential causality problem pointed out by Kamaho et al. Um, Later. Yeah, uh, uh, which one? Uh, Certainly the... LS divided by B. It is a pure... It is a yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, uh, may, maybe I, uh, I didn't mention it here. I will mention it in the second part. The tidal excitations can be fully uh, um, compared with the with the propagation of a string in Eichelboot sexel. Cla uh, well, classical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what we did is the quantum version, namely to study quantization of string in an Eichelboot Excel, and then you find this. Now, probably in, for some large enough strings, big enough strings, you can also have a classical, a classical tidal deformation of the string itself. Probably you have to go to coherent states to define something which semi-classically represents a long classical string. Yeah. Now, uh, an important point again, already mentioned by Massimo, is that even single graviton region exchange gives a complex scattering amplitude. Remember, you had an e to the i pi something. And this is because of old, good old Dolan-Horn-Smith duality, that the imaginary part of the scattering amplitude is related to the formation of closed strings in the S-channel. Now, that process is exponentially suppressed at large impact parameter. That's why we neglected it so far, but now becomes important. And even that is, has a smooth limit when you go to a vanishing impact parameter. So I remind you simply 
uh, is a three-level version of what I had before, that the two strings can produce, you know, can merge into a single heavy one, and it is precisely that intermediate state which produces the imaginary part of the amplitude. So even at genus zero, you can yes, absolutely. Even at genus zero, that's the difference between string theory and normal graviton exchange. Uh, and say, if you go to higher genus, you can go through many, you can now I turn the diagram uh, by 90 degrees, you can, you can have formation of several strings. Now, I think this was already shown by Massimo. The imaginary part is given by this formula. Now you see it's, it's, it's highly suppressed at large impact parameters simply because the imaginary part doesn't have the Coulomb singularity. So when you go to the Fourier transform, it falls down exponentially. And, uh, but if you go now to be smaller than the string length times a log, then more and more strings are produced, and the average number of strings which you produce grows with the square of the center of mass energy. That means that the average energy per string starts to decrease as uh, the incoming energy is increased. So you get this uh, anti-scaling type of behavior in which the final particle's average energy is inversely proportional to the total incoming energy, which is what roughly, qualitatively, what you expect in black hole physics. In fact, as you go to an energy which is the threshold of the expected black hole production regime, when the Schwarzschild radius of the of the produced black hole would be equal to the string length parameter, at that point, the average number of, uh, of strings that you produce approaches the entropy of a black hole of that mass, which turns out to be one over g squared. This is related to the black hole uh, string uh, correspondence, if you know what I, what I mean. So. Uh, so this is the S-channel an analog of the fractionation we have seen already in the T-channel. Now, finally, let's move to region three, which is where I have very little to say because we couldn't make a lot of progress there. So what happens there? Uh, well, here we try to resum classical corrections without keeping you know, for simplicity, uh, string corrections become, because we don't know exactly how to do those, those string corrections beyond leading order in R over B. So let's forget about the string corrections and let's try to resum the classical corrections. Now, classical physics is very often associated with three diagrams, and indeed, it is three diagrams which dominate in this regime. Uh, although these are, you know, in a sense, loops, but if you take away the lead, the fast incoming particles, then what goes on in the middle are only three diagrams. And you can see by power counting that the contribution to the action from these diagrams scales in the correct way uh, you know, contains only one over, I mean, the action doesn't contain any, any power of the Planck constant. Now, summing three diagrams corresponds to solving a classical field theory, which is the effective field theory for this trans-Planckian scattering. Well, we have, since um, 2007, with Amati and Cefaloni, we tried to construct such a theory uh, we, uh, we should have started indeed from something related to the work of, um, oh, the name now escapes me, Lipatov, but that is already too difficult, so we, we butchered a little bit Lipatov's theory, reducing it to a two-dimensional field theory, which 
we could solve in some cases, analytically, numerically. And what you see on the positive side is the emergence of critical surfaces. Uh, uh, critical in what sense? From this point of view, they are for the existence of, this is not Ramon Ramon, is <laughs> real regular solutions. Um, namely, you try to find a classical solution to your classical field theory, and when you go to small impact parameter, at some point, uh, you don't find, I mean, the solution ceases to exist. Now, the points, these critical points where this happens are in good agreement with what you expect for uh, you know, classical collapse criteria based on constructing a closed trap surface from the collision. So on that, that is on the positive side. On the negative side, uh, you seem to lose unitarity as you go on the other side of those critical surfaces. And to understand this is a big challenge. I call it challenge, challenge number two. Uh, we don't know. Perhaps it's because we concentrate ourselves w with on regular complex solutions. Maybe one should have taken instead uh, real singular solutions. And uh, in that case, maybe, you know, some uh, string theory modification of, of the singularity would be necessary in order to recover unitarity. So, this is a program that was abandoned about 10, 10 years ago, but at some point we want to go back to it. Okay, now part, se part two of the talk is about string brain collisions. That is also a very interesting process in which a pure initial state uh, should evolve into a complicated but yet presumably still pure state preserving information, unitarity, and so on. It's an easier problem than the one I was describing till now because the string now acts as a probe on a geometry which is determined by the heavy brain system. And also here we are not assuming a metric to start with. We do calculations in flat space time. The D brains are introduced via the boundary state formalism. Uh, one simplification is that by going to some large N, where N is the number of D brains, the stack of D brains contains N of them, uh, we can go to a regime in which we can neglect closed string loops, and therefore, for instance, we can get rid of gravitational Bremsstrahlung, which would be subleading in this large N limit. Uh, so this, suppose it's a, it's a simple problem. Here are some references, very incomplete list of references. And this is a picture of what is going on. I mean, we have a stack of N, uh, P brains, and then, you know, we have an incoming string orthogonal to the hyperplane of the, of the brains at some impact parameter B and we can study the deflection of the, of the closed string or eventually its absorption its, um, by the brain system. Again, we can look at the relevant scales in the problem. Two are, you, you know already, the third one, which replaces the short field radius, is just the typical uh, scale of the geometry produced by the D brain system. And by playing with G string and with the number of brains, you can again make this RP either bigger or smaller than the string scale. Again, therefore, you have three regions and things are rather similar, except that now you don't expect any black hole to form, but uh, what replaces the regime of collapse is the regime in which the, the closed string is, is captured, if you want, by the brain system. 
uh, so you have a conversion of, um, of um, kinetic energy of the closed string is converted into excitation of strings, of open strings living on the brain, uh, which can be heavy or, as we will see, uh, can be of different type. Now, the semi-classical approximation also resembles very much the one we had previously, mutatis mutandis. You see here now you, you have, again, a leading term, classical corrections, and string corrections. And here, too, there are subregions. So, <clears throat> the results on the string brain collisions, again, the deflection angle, time delay, agreement with curve space-time calculation, uh, unitarity preserving tidal excitation of the string. Uh, then there are short distance corrections and resolution of this potential causality problem, absorption via closed open transition, and finally, in, in the third region of parameter space, you would expect to have dissipation into many open strings, thermalization, unitarity, but that's, of course, the difficult case. So, <clears throat> um, so first of all, in this weak gravity regime, uh, this is a picture, again, of string brain, uh, of, of uh, yeah, string brain collisions. Um, you see in the T-channel you have again closed strings, for instance gravitons. In the open, in the in the S-channel now, you have open strings. Again, the amplitude is not real, and the imaginary part of the three-level amplitude is is due to the fact that you have uh, open strings now in the S, in the S-channel. So this is just to show you that we have explicit results for the deflection angle. Now we have it to leading and to next to leading order. This is the leading term, which goes like Rp over B to the 7 minus P. This is the correction with the precise coefficient. And this is from the calculation of the iconal, and it fits perfectly well with exact classical deflection formula in the in the in the metric produced by the brain system. Now, if you go to annulus or to one loop level, then you see new phenomena. At least two of them. One is the tidal excitation of the initial string. You see, this closed string interacts with the brain and gets converted into another string. Uh, but then you also see, for instance, the possibility to produce more than one uh, open string in the, in the, in the S-channel. Now, the tidal effects can be computed. They come out in complete agreement with what one would obtain by quantizing the string in the D-brain metric. This answers your question. And the tidal effects become relevant be below a critical impact parameter, which is parametrically larger than the, than the uh, Schwarzschild or the geomet geometrical radius, you know, if you take energies which are, which are large. And in this paper with uh, Paolo, Rodolfo, and Giuseppe, and also in a subsequent paper, we have studied in detail the actual microscopic structure of the excited states that ensure unitarity in this regime. And again, this is not yet done beyond le the leading term in, uh, in R over B. We plan to do it soon. Uh, this is related to the challenge number one that we had in the string-string collision case. Then, moving on to the string gravity regime here, as I uh, mentioned, this is where um, we see string modifications of the iconal phase when we go to small impact parameter. This is the regime in which, uh, according to 
these authors, you could possibly have uh, causality violations um, in the presence of higher order corrections to Einstein's gravity, higher derivative corrections, but in string theory, these are absent as they themselves had uh, guessed or argued. And here we can see explicitly how this happens. And the, you know, the short uh, lect lesson is that regex behavior saves string theory from causality problems because the phase shift and also the time delay have a smooth expansion, uh, sorry, the, yeah, this is a single formula in B squared divided by L string square of a log S, and this log S, which comes from Regge, uh, you know, saves, uh, saves the situation. You don't get ever any problem with, uh, with a, with a or causal time delay. Um, then, as I mentioned, <coughs> Uh, already at three level you have this uh, single heavy open strings which can be produced by the closed one and uh, uh, so again this is related to the regular behavior in string theory and again it is exponentially damped at large input parameter parallels the string string collision but here like in the other case, we were able to describe the process at an exclusive microscopic level. So again, we know exactly which open string, which superposition of open string states are produced by a given closed string state as a function of its energy, okay? You see, you have some light closed string hitting the brain and, uh, and producing a heavy object which of course has many, many possible uh, states, oscillator occupation numbers, and we know exactly how to describe those. Um, finally, if you move to the regime of strong gravity where, oh, sorry, where the RP is bigger than the string length, then there you expect to have not only this transition from between one close to one open strings, but you will, as you will have transition between one closed and many, many uh, open, uh, open strings. So that's what I call capture with fractionation, whereas here you have capture without fractionation. So this is the typical diagram, say at, at, at the annulus level. Um, now, what is interesting is to compare the number of closed strings in the string-string collision and the number of open strings that you produce in the string-brain collision as a function of the, of the various parameters. So, and what is interesting is that in the case of, of string-string collision, as you, uh, as you approach the limit where this, the Schwarzschild radius becomes of order L string or bigger, uh, if you extrapolate, which is of course the regime in which you don't know how to do the calculation, so, but as you approach it, say from below, uh, the energy, the typical energy of the closed string becomes smaller than the, than the string sc scale. So, you'd expect to only produce massless string modes. Hawking radiation, quote, question mark. We don't know how to do it. Um, in the string brain scattering, something similar happens, and the uh, number of open strings that you produce tends to be so large that each one of them, again, becomes massless. So the hope is to make contact with some CFT which lives on the brain system in, in that limit. But this, again, is, uh, is a challenge for the future. So 
can we construct a unitary S matrix describing the absorption and fractionation regime in the stream brain collision? This would be the analog of seeing how information is preserved when you form a, a black hole, although we think it's a more tractable problem, but still not an easy one. Okay, how much time? Ten minutes. Okay, so I'll try to quickly go through this uh, topic number three. Gravitational perhaps problem from ultra-relativistic collisions. So this is the typical process we'd like to uh, study. We have the collision of two ultra-relativistic particles or strings, but for the moment we'll only do deal with particles, which are gravitationally deflected by theta sub s, s for scattering, with the emission of a gravitational wave at some polar angle theta and azimuthal angle phi. Okay. Now, this process has been approached in three different ways. There is a classical, completely classical GR approach, which I started with in, uh, several years ago with Andrei Gruzinov at, at NYU. There is a quantum iconal approach which follows the, the same philosophy of the rest of the talk. And then there is the soft theorem approach that Massimo illustrated, and which also has important contributions by these other authors. Now, comments. Uh, number two goes to number one in the classical limit, which is good news, okay? We recover from this quantum iconal approach the classical results. And they agree with number three in the overlap of their respective domains of validity, which is also good news. We are the domains of validity. Well, the classical GR and quantum iconal approaches for the moment are limited to small angle scattering, so theta s much less than one, but cover a rather wide range of gravitational wave frequencies. On the other hand, the soft theorem approach is not limited to small deflection angle. You can consider an arbitrary uh, two to two scattering, but they are strongly limited in the frequency region uh, where they apply. So, however, there are overlap, these regions overlap, and so you can compare the results in the overlapping region. So I will sketch very, very uh, quickly the classical approach. It is based on Huygens' superposition principle, which for gravity includes in an essential way the gravitational time delay in the shock wave matrix. So I'm not going to explain to you this picture. We'll take more than the 10 minutes, eight minutes <laughs> left. But this is just to give you an idea of how you reconstruct the far wave, the far away wave out of uh, coherent sum of different ways which have a geometrical phase, phase difference plus a phase difference due to the gravitational time delay. So we did that with Gruzinov and got some result which since it coincides with the one we get in the other treatment I will not show now, I will only show it later. So in the quantum treatment using the iconal approach which I have been describing in the rest of the talk, you have to be careful and consider the emission both from external and internal legs throughout the whole ladder, okay? We have this ladder which gives the iconal phase, the exponentiation, and when you consider, when you add Bremsstrahlung, you have to uh, consider emission of soft gravitons for the whole ladder. Now, and also one should take into account the difference between the Coulomb phases of the final, say if you have two to three with one soft graviton, 
you have a Coulomb phase associated with the initial two particle state and another Coulomb phase associated with the uh, three particle final state. Now, these Coulomb phases are typically infinite, as we know, in four dimensions. And, um, but the difference between the two and three particles Coulomb phase is finite and gives a finite important contribution, as you will see in a moment. Anyway, when this is all done and you keep track of all the combinatorics and so on and so forth, what we showed is that this allows to recover the result of Grusinov and myself if you take the limit h bar omega over square root of s going to zero. Uh, and this is the result in that classical limit. Sorry, it's a little bit messy, but as you can see, it's very explicit. You know, you can get, the, for instance, the spectrum in terms of these news functions, which are themselves given at these two-dimensional integrals. These are precisely this uh, plane from which you do your Huygens uh, principle. There are some oscillating factors and so on and so forth. Um, Uh, it's interesting also to note that the two polarizations of the gravitational waves, um, if you take them to be circular polarization, namely definite helicity, they are not a complex conjugate of each other. Namely, only this part is complex conjugated as you go from helicity plus two to helicity minus two, but not this part. Uh, okay, there are other things, but uh, time is short. So let me give you some analytic result, which I think is a very amusing. We find a, what I would like to call a hawking knee and also an unexpected bump. So what are they? Uh, so let me describe the spectrum in formula, then we'll see some pictures and then we go home. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I told you that we are dealing with small angle scattering, so 1 over b is much smaller than 1 over r, so we can study the spectrum in this region between the two, and we find that the spectrum is almost flat in omega, but it's actually logarithmically decreasing, so slowly decreasing in omega. Now, if you go to omega equal 1 over b, this becomes the deflection angle, R over B, and actually the spectrum freezes below one over B. So below one over B, you recover the zero frequency limit that Massimo described. So that's a very nice non-trivial check. If you go above one over R, you will get this hawking knee because the the, 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 the spectrum, instead of keeping decreasing slowly, like log, one over log, uh, like, yeah, like log, say, uh, starts to decrease like one over omega. Okay. Now, one over omega is nice, gives this knee, but of course, uh, cannot be integrated up to infinity in omega, or you get an infinite efficiency for emitting gravitational waves. That would make our friends in LIGO and VIGO very happy to have an infinite efficiency. But uh, So there must be some cutoff at, high, at higher omega, which is my challenge number four. Find the cutoff and the spectrum above the cutoff. Here we had some guess with Grusinov. Uh, we think that this 1 over omega behavior should stop at 1 over r theta scattering to the minus 2. And in fact, if you continue the 1 over omega behavior beyond that limit and you fully transform back from omega to time, you find that otherwise you violate a so-called Dyson bound, which I'm not sure Dyson believes in, but anyway, it's called like that. 
d dt has the dimensions of one of the, the Newton constant, and uh, some people believe that this is an absolute limit on power. Okay, you cannot have a process in which the emitted power is larger than one over g. Now, there is no Planck constant here. But if you want, you can say you emit a Planck mass in a Planck time, but the H bars cancel. <laughs> so there is no, yeah, this is a classical limit. And we had a seminar recently at CERN by Cardozo, who seemed to believe in it. And uh, I don't know, he's still uh, subject to, to, uh, to discussion. So if you take this, then you get a nice efficiency. Now. Yeah, let's move fast. Now, uh, if you, if I, I show you again the the formula I had a moment ago, on this formula you would as, you would suspect that the spectrum is monotonically decreasing in omega. However, this appears not to be the case in four dimensions, and this is due to this uh, uh, residual effect from the Coulomb from the diverging Coulomb phases. As I told you, uh, you can cancel the divergent part. And by the way, we've, we get results which are very much consistent with uh, Ashok Sen's guess that the logs of some tau, which goes to infinity, should be replaced by log of omega. Here we get it directly in this form without doing any and, and so we, we, we find that the corrections of order omega and of order, and of order omega square, which are the consequence of the sub and sub-sub leading corrections to the soft theorems, contain logs. One log here and two logs here. Higher logs are suppressed by powers of the scattering angle. And uh, so they... Uh, for us, they come from the mismatch between the two and three body Coulomb phase. Now, this, um, okay, this, this logs disappear when you go above omega b equal one, so they don't affect the previous discussion, but they are very relevant in the region of very small omega. Now, at order uh, omega b, omega, with, with and without log of omega enhancements, the corrections appear for circularly polarized gravitational waves, but these appear either from the more standard plus and times polarization, the linear polarization, or after summing over them, or after integration over the azimuthal angle. So, in fact, in particular, in the calculation with uh, uh, with Massimo, that he described, we didn't find any effect of order omega, but we, we immediately summed over the polarization, so this is very consistent. Uh, in any case, if we don't integrate and we look at circular polarization and so on, we seem to be in complete agreement with Ashok and collaborators. Um, However, and this is, was a little bit a surprise, the leading term omega square log square omega turns out to be positive and to produce a bump in the spectrum at omega b of order of 0.5 or so. Um, so I will skip this and only show some, some results. You know, this is supposed to show the turn into a one over omega r behavior of the spectrum. This is a log-log plot, so this will be a straight line in this plot. Um, uh, this, on the other hand, shows the one over log or the log behavior. This is a different plot. You see it's linear log, so this straight line is because of the log. Uh, you see how different scattering angles finally converge to give a universal uh, curve, provided you normalize the, the energy spectrum with gs theta s square. 
Uh, and this is the bump, on, uh, you know, admittedly the modest bump. <laughs> okay, it's not so prominent, but you can see here that the, that before t going down, the, the flux, d, the omega, has a little peak, which may become more pronounced as you go to big angles, but as I told you, we, we are not able yet to go to bigger angles. This is a blow up of the, of the same picture at small omega b. You, you clearly see that the, there is a maximum which is not at uh, omega equals zero. And these are nicer pictures of the differential spectrum also in angle and frequency. I could comment on this different things. And the last slide is to say that there is complementarity, in my opinion, between all this and what people now are recently doing on calculating the 3 p.m. conservative potential, Bern and company in particular, which can be applied to the effective one-body uh, potential of Damour and Bonanno, which are very relevant for the for computing the gravitational waveforms when you have uh, these binary mergers. So eventually we would like to extend this method to arbitrary masses and kinematics, leading hopefully to a full understanding of gravitational scattering and radiation at that level of 3 p.m., which means two loops. And with such a motivation in mind, I am pleased to announce a, a workshop which will take place here next year entitled Gravitational Scattering in Spiral and Radiation. Thank you. Of gravitational, uh, who who did that? Peters. Oh, Peters. Oh, yeah. I see. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's not massless, massless. It's massless on black hole. Okay, I have to look at that. And he looked at several impact parameters, uh, several regimes. Oh, so it's very similar to me. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's an interesting point. I'm very curious, yeah, to see then. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Paolo? They are of a big correction to the shock wave. No, so the, the point is this. Uh, that's the difference between the string-string collision and the string-brain collision. In the string-brain collision, we know the metric. And, okay, the question of finding what happened. But in the string-string collisions, only at, uh, at this leading order, R over B, we can really approximate the process by taking one string and computing what it does in the metric produced by the other string. By the way, this is the way Toft in 87 got the scattering. He, he, he computed the time shift, and then from the time shift times the energy got the phase shift. And, uh, but we, we proved and we showed him many subsequent papers, that that cannot hold beyond the leading iconal. The, the metric is not that one. I mean, the, the metric is produced by the, by the two particles together. You can no longer say it's the metric of one and the other acts as a test particle. You cannot.
Well, that, that will be closer to, to the brain, to the brain. Yeah, yeah, no. If you take the other one to be very massive, then you will, in the limit, you will go to the situation in which one acts as a... Yeah, what, what was a little fishy in Toft's argument is that he said, well, let me take, let me boost the system and make one very energetic and one very soft, and then he only put the contribution of the time delay of the soft one produced by the hard one. And I never understood, no, f eventually I understood, I never understood his argument. I finally understood, I think, why he got the right result. But I think with the wrong argument. <laughs> Because it's symmetric, you see. It, it, the, it is true that the time delay of the soft particle is big, but you multiply it by its energy, which is small, and you get exactly the same result for the fast particle, which has a small time delay, but a big energy. And the product of the two is the same. So you should have gotten, by this argument, twice the, the, the phase shift. And with, uh, with Vilkovsky, uh, Pettorino, and Fabricesi, we understood that, uh, we understood how the factor of two gets fixed. But, you know, I don't want to, in private, I can explain it to you. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think it's true in the string string case. I mean, we, we argued, you know, in, in another paper we argued that there is a, a correction of order R cube over B cube. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we don't know if this is really correct. I mean, we, we had a, a calculation which it was not a full two-loop calculation. We got some shortcut argument based on analyticity crossing and so on, and uh, we are still checking it. <laughs>